Welcome to the Political Podcast, Policy in a Golden State of Mind. And thank you for joining me for our first full episode. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to go back and listen to our introductory show, the very first entry in our series, to learn what this podcast is all about. To tune in, just visit our site at politicalpod.blogspot.com or check out our profile on iTunes or SoundCloud. My name is Tony Mostria, and today we're talking about redistricting, how we draw the lines around the people we elect to represent us. As you may know, the state of California recently reformed the way these districts are drawn, a development that has immediate and enduring consequences for voters all across the state. Between 2008 and 2010, California voters approved two separate ballot initiatives, removing the power of redistricting from the state legislature and placing it in the hands of an independent commission, essentially preventing lawmakers from being able to draw their own districts. And since then, we've been through two statewide elections, 2012 and 2014, to see the results of this change play out. So we now have some early indicators of how these reforms have been successful and where they're still in need of improvement. But before we talk about how redistricting works, let's go over why it exists in the first place. Every American in every state is represented by two members of their state's legislature. One from the upper house, called the state senate, and one from the lower house, which, in California, is called the state assembly. The only exception to this rule is Nebraska, which has just one house in its legislature, and therefore just one representative per person. Every American is also represented at the federal level by one member of the U.S. House of Representatives. That said, every lawmaker represents a specific geographic area that's redrawn once every 10 years following the most recent U.S. Census. In order to ensure that every American has an equal voice in the political process, all assembly districts, senate districts, and congressional districts are made equal to each other in population. But from year to year, people move from town to town, and as a result, some districts get larger while others get smaller. So every once in a while, we need to readjust the boundaries to accommodate these changes. That's where redistricting comes in. Redistricting is the power to redraw the lines around legislative and congressional districts, and with it, the power to exert enormous influence over the state's political landscape. Ideally, redistricting creates an electoral environment that gives every voter in every community an equal say in the workings of government. Unfortunately, redistricting can also be used maliciously, allowing lawmakers to dilute the influence of certain groups or shut them out of the political process altogether. This usually occurs through a process called gerrymandering, where lawmakers surgically select the neighborhoods and constituencies in each district to serve some political or ideological purpose. To put it another way, gerrymandering is often compared to representatives choosing their voters as opposed to voters choosing their representatives. For most of its history, the California Constitution empowered state legislators to draw their own districts. It also gave them the power to draw the districts of U.S. House members, who not only serve as their political allies at the federal level, but also occupy congressional seats that state lawmakers might like to have someday. The conflict of interest here should be obvious. In a free society, with a government accountable to the people, even the most well-intentioned lawmakers should not have control over their own job security. It's like telling the employees of an organization that they'll be subject to performance reviews, but that they'll be allowed to write their own criteria for evaluation. It sounds absurd, but this is how California operated until just a few years ago, and most other states continue to do so. In our case, the story of redistricting reform begins a half century ago and is one of partisan gamesmanship and political expediency. Given California's blue blood reputation, it may not come as a shock to hear that Democrats have controlled the legislature for 44 of the past 50 years. But you might be surprised to learn that Republicans have controlled the governor's office for about 30 of those past 50 years. This partisan split naturally caused the governor and the legislature to clash frequently on policy issues, including redistricting. In 1971, where our story starts, California's Democratic lawmakers passed a set of redistricting maps that gave them a distinct electoral advantage over their Republican counterparts. The governor at the time, Republican Ronald Reagan, saw through this political cartography and vetoed the maps. Democrats in turn did not have the votes to override the governor's decision, so instead the California Supreme Court stepped in to resolve the dispute. To do so, the court appointed a panel of three retired judges called the Special Masters to redraw the maps. Now, setting aside the fact that the Special Masters sounds like a cheap, knockoff superhero league, the panel had an important job to do and got it done, succeeding where the state's elected leaders had failed. In 
But because redistricting is, by definition, a recurring part of the political process, this would not be the end of the contention surrounding it. Ten years later, in 1981, Democratic lawmakers passed another set of redistricting maps that again gave them a clear political advantage over Republicans. The difference this time was that Republican legislators did not have an ally in the governor's office to back them up, since the position, at the time, was occupied by Democrat Jerry Brown, The same Jerry Brown, by the way, who's now governor again today. So instead of relying on a gubernatorial veto to nullify the maps, Republicans brought the issue directly to voters. In a series of referenda that appeared on the ballot in 1982, over 60% of voters rejected the maps passed by Democrats, forcing them to develop a compromise plan with Republicans instead. Buoyed by their win at the ballot box, Republicans sought to carry their victory even further. Over the next decade, they proposed three separate ballot initiatives removing redistricting authority from the state legislature for good and placing it in the hands of an independent commission. And while none of these initiatives passed, they helped set the terms for the debate moving forward and served as a precursor to the reforms that would come over two decades later. The 1990s were largely a repeat of the 1970s. In 1991, Democratic lawmakers passed a set of redistricting maps favorable to their party, which were summarily vetoed by Republican Governor Pete Wilson. So once again, the California Supreme Court summoned the special masters, I assume through some rooftop spotlight pointed at the sky, who redrew the maps in time for the 1992 elections. By the time the new century rolled around, Democrats once again held unified control over the state's legislative and executive branches, this time in the form of Democratic Governor Gray Davis. But after three decades of partisan bickering, Democrats were not enthusiastic about relitigating the battles of the past. So in 2001, instead of drawing maps based on party advantage, they compromised with Republicans on a plan to protect incumbent advantage, meaning the priority of the process would be in maintaining the balance of power and keeping current legislators in office, regardless of party. While this had the benefit of precluding another protracted fight over redistricting, it also had the effect of making the districts astoundingly uncompetitive and highly polarized. In the five general elections between 2002 and 2010, California held a total of 500 elections for Assembly and Senate seats across the state. And among those 500 districts up for grabs, just 10 elected representatives from a different party than the one they had before. 500 elections, 10 party changes. You could count the number of flips by yourself on two hands. The effects on the state's congressional delegation were even starker. Between 2002 and 2010, California held a total of 265 elections for U.S. House seats. And out of those 265 contests, just one district changed parties in the entire decade. To add insult to injury, a 2011 study in the American Journal of Political Science found that California's legislature was by far the most polarized of all 50 states. In Sacramento, the ideological divide between Democratic and Republican lawmakers was measurably wider than anywhere else in the country. Not surprisingly, this philosophical fissure drove years and years of political gridlock, much to the detriment of our state and its residents. Among the reformers to take note of this unfortunate state of affairs was California's Republican governor and resident action star Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 2005, the governor called a special election asking voters to decide on several pressing issues in his policy agenda, including redistricting reform. If successful, his initiative would have established an independent commission to oversee redistricting, similar to the reforms proposed in the 1980s. Unfortunately, the proposal was largely overshadowed by some of the more contentious issues on the ballot and was unceremoniously swept away by the mass rejection that voters delivered on Election Day. Whatever this revealed about voters and their mood for reform, this would be the last time that Californians said no to such an idea. Just three years later, in 2008, California voters approved Proposition 11, the Voters' First Act, by a razor-thin margin of just 51 to 49 percent. The Voters' First Act established a 14-member commission of California residents to oversee redistricting of the state's Assembly and Senate districts, as well as the four districts comprising the State Board of Equalization. The commission established by the Voters' First Act was intended to reflect and respect the political differences across the state. Among its 14 members, five would be registered Democrats, five registered Republicans, and four unaffiliated with either party, including third-party members and registered independents. 
In addition, the commission was designed to serve as a firewall from the state's corridors of influence to prevent the types of partisan mapmaking that had occurred in the past. To be eligible to serve, no commission member could have direct ties to any state or federal candidate for the past 10 years. This includes being a paid staffer, a lobbyist, a family member, or a contributor of more than $2,000 in any election cycle. Proponents of the initiative hope these protections would empower the commission to do its job effectively and honestly while placating concerns about undue pressure from self-interested office holders. But since Prop 11 passed in 2008 and the redistricting process would not begin until after the next U.S. Census, Californians would have some time to review the new procedure they'd put in place. And two years later, they were asked to do just that. In November 2010, voters were faced with two ballot initiatives that would determine the future of the state's nascent redistricting commission. The first, Proposition 27, would have repealed the Voters' First Act, eliminated the commission, and returned redistricting authority back to the state legislature. The second, Proposition 20, would have not only preserved the powers of the commission, but expanded them to include the drawing of congressional districts. After Prop 11's hair margin victory in 2008, one might suspect that these competing initiatives would spur a close rematch. But by the time all the ballots had been counted, voters had embraced reform and rejected repeal by a decisive 60 to 40 percent. Defying its roller coaster history, redistricting reform had at long last received a definitive judgment in California, and the new commission could finally get to work. During the selection period, 36,000 Californians applied to serve on the redistricting commission. Of those, the list was narrowed down to 60 of the pool's most qualified candidates, including 20 Democrats, 20 Republicans, and 20 unaffiliated with either party. After that, leaders in the state legislature were given the opportunity to veto up to 24 names from the list, and from the remaining applicant pool, the state auditor randomly selected the first eight members of the commission three Democrats, three Republicans, and two unaffiliated. These eight members were then tasked with choosing the remaining commissioners, bringing the total to 14. Once its membership was finalized, the commission got to work on drawing the maps, which was a long, difficult, and incremental process. As required by the Voters' First Act, the commission submitted multiple drafts interspersed by periods of public review, which included dozens of public hearings and over 20,000 comments from residents across the state. When the maps that arose from this process were ultimately put to a vote in the commission, they received the requisite nine yeses for approval, including from three Democratic members, three Republican members, and three unaffiliated members. The maps were certified on August 15, 2011, leaving enough time to prepare for elections the following year. So now we've undergone two election cycles, 2012 and 2014, where these maps have been in place, and we ought to ask ourselves whether they've truly made a substantive difference from what we had before. Now, two election cycles is not a large enough sample size to draw any sweeping conclusions, but it's all we have, and at the very least, it offers some early signs of what we might expect to see moving forward. By some measures, the reforms seem to have worked as intended. According to an analysis by the PPIC, and first off, get your head out of the gutter, it stands for Public Policy Institute of California, According to an analysis by the PPIC, 45% of the territory that incumbents campaigned for in 2012 was brand new, meaning officeholders had to appeal to new voters in new neighborhoods rather than take for granted the same constituencies that had elected them before. This fact alone meant that elections would likely be more competitive simply due to voters' lack of familiarity with the candidates, at least for a cycle or two. As a result, redistricting placed many incumbents on the defensive in 2012, After seeing the new maps, nine members of California's 53-member congressional delegation declined to run for re-election, resulting in the highest number of open House seats in two decades. And when you include the five incumbent representatives who decided to run but ultimately lost, the turnover rate in California's congressional delegation jumped to 26% that year. In a state where it's not unusual to re-elect 100% of our representatives, 26% turnover in a single year isn't bad. Similarly, the number of open assembly seats was also well above average, leading to the election of 38 new assembly members, representing nearly half of the 80-member chamber. The question remains, though, did California's new redistricting law really render districts more competitive? Or was this turnover attributable to the usual upending that occurs after every round of redistricting? According to an analysis by Devin McCarthy at FairVote, 
the proportion of swing districts to safe districts in California was roughly the same between 2008 and 2012, which would seem to suggest that redistricting had little effect on competition. As McCarthy points out, however, it's possible that any gains in competitiveness were simply offset by changes in voter preference. In other words, California's redistricting commission may have made the districts less partisan at the same time voters themselves were becoming more polarized. This hypothesis fits into a larger theory called the big sort, where like-minded voters who are able to move freely from one jurisdiction to another naturally and increasingly choose to live near each other. If that's the case, and if voters themselves are creating these hyper-partisan locales, then no amount of redistricting is going to make them competitive without fracturing entire cities and towns. In addition to concerns over competitiveness, it's also worth asking whether the commission is truly insulated from the types of political influence it was designed to preclude. An in-depth expose by ProPublica describes how Democrats in the state's congressional delegation used the public input process to manipulate the drawing of U.S. House districts. To do so, they relied on a provision in the Voters' First Act requiring that new districts preserve, quote, communities of interest wherever possible. According to the California Constitution, a community of interest is a contiguous population which shares common social and economic interests. And for the sake of fairness, commissioners chose to adopt an expansive view of what this meant. Because Congress members themselves could not participate in the public input process, they enlisted the aid of local voters to petition the commission on behalf of specific communities of interest, communities that were often dubious and just happened to coincide with the district boundaries that Congress members were seeking to preserve. Commissioners might have been able to detect this partisan permeation were it not for the requirement that they refrain from taking political considerations into account. Despite these potential vulnerabilities, I'd argue that the system we have now is a substantial improvement over the one we had before, and with a few minor adjustments, we could conceivably mitigate these problems by the time the next round of redistricting occurs. According to a report by the League of Women Voters, the greatest hurdle that commissioners faced was a lack of time and resources. The commission was given only eight months to draw up the maps that would partition the state for the next ten years, and that includes setting aside multiple rounds of public review and private revision. Eight months would be a tight squeeze for any group of 14 people laboring over such a daunting task, especially in a state with nearly 40 million residents. But this time crunch was also compounded by a lack of financial and institutional support. Commission members said they were unable to assemble the necessary equipment and resources to get a timely start on the process, making the deadline that much more pressing. In addition, the Voters' First Act has been bombarded with political and legal challenges since its inception, making our continued support of it that much more vital. In addition to Prop 27, which sought to repeal the new law in 2010, the Voters' First Act was tested at the Supreme Court just this year. The heart of the case, which actually dealt with Arizona's Independent Redistricting Commission, was the Elections Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which says, quote, The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, end quote. The question at hand was whether a commission created by voters via ballot initiative constituted the will of the legislature, as required by the Constitution. Opponents, in the form of the Arizona State Legislature itself, argued that the commission did not conform to this narrow standard set forth by the Constitution. Supporters of the commission argued in turn that because the legislature had created the initiative process in the first place, it had empowered voters to tackle issues like redistricting via popular vote. The court sided 5-4 to four with the commission's proponents. Good news for Arizona and California, as well as the 19 other states that use some variation of an independent commission. While these issues appear settled for now, political, legal, and philosophical challenges to the independent redistricting commission are almost certain to continue, and it's up to us to ensure that they don't succeed. While the new system is still far from perfect, just ask yourself if it's worth going back to the old status quo, where lawmakers control their own political destiny and, by extension, control ours as well. Thank you for joining me on this first full episode of the Political Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. 
You can find all the source material from this episode and more by visiting our website at politicalpod.blogspot.com. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or things to add to the conversation, you are highly encouraged to do so. You can find the show on social media at facebook.com slash politicalpod and on Twitter at politicalpod. Thanks again. See you next week.